So my first question was going to be how you're feeling, but I know you have a poll. So could you talk to me about it? Uh, yeah. How is your day been going? Well, we're rehearsing. We'll start um, soft. We'll start soft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scott Elliott is directing uh, Mike Lee's Abigail's Party, which I'm doing right now. And he's the only director that Mike Lee trusts, and he's doing this brilliant job. So it's so much fun. Now, of course, we're into the second act, which is. I don't know if you guys, if you, if you haven't seen the film, don't. Because <laughs> I want you to come and see it with me, and then and I don't want to suffer by comparison. <laughs> but um, it's really just the most brilliant piece of writing, and it's so funny and harrowing and just scathing, and I absolutely love doing it, but it takes its toll emotionally, even though it's very, very funny, because, you know, it's funny when you're watching it, but it's not supposed to be funny for us. But um, anyway, I got sick today, and uh, I guess you can kind of hear it. And I just took some stuff to, because my nose was running furiously, and hopefully that will stop. Otherwise, I've got some clean eyes sitting there. It's great. Um, you're famous for preparing intensely for your work. You're not the type who just shows up at the set or shows up on the stage. Talk to me about what you've done to prepare for this role. Nothing. <laughs> well, that's a first. Now, I um, actually, uh, this role, it's, there's something about, it's so well written, but I think, aside from like reading the Vogues and the Cosmos from the period, I think you can only kind of screw it up by over-intellectualizing it. I think that it's so, it's such a perfect and like, it's funny to use the word beautiful with a mic lead piece because it's so, there's something so kind of ugly in its beauty. But if you just say the words, basically, you're going to get it right, you know? So I think the thing that's most important is to be as free as possible in it and not get in its way. And um, I've just worked incredibly hard with Steve Davis, who's the dialect coach, and I think the best I've ever worked with. He's, you know, for actors in here, he's really dynamite and um, he's also a great actor so like when you're rehearsing with him you get so much from him and um, no it's just living it it's actually just living it and allowing yourself to embrace all of its ugliness and all of its you know it's just it's great great stuff I mean I I can't wait to do it because I just I, I just love it so much I love going to rehearsal now anyone who's remotely familiar with your filmography I guess with would know that you're attracted to darker roles. Um, Rex Reed once said that you like playing sluts and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> you do. How do you feel about, one, how do you feel about that assessment, and two, is there any truth to that? Um, I think it's funny. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's so bad, you know, because. Um, they're more interesting characters to play. Mm -hmm. if, if you're an actor, you don't necessarily, I mean, I don't anyway, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not interested in sort of just playing the typical ingenue right. character. Like, you asked me before, like, oh, but now that you're not an ingenue, I was like, I'm just not an I'm not, I'm not really interested in, I used to, when I was a kid, I would say, play the part that's just to show that the guy isn't gay. Because a lot of women's roles, really, that's, that's their function in a screenplay, in a movie, and that doesn't interest me, and it's not um, compelling. So usually the parts that are more complicated, unfortunately, the way Hollywood is, it's like, if a part's going to be complicated, then it's going to be a prostitute, or it's going to be a drug addict, or, you know, just, I mean, we are all very complicated people, but for some reason, um, a lot of movies can't seem to realize that or don't want to realize that, and so that's why those roles become more appealing. Is there something about these characters that you can fundamentally relate to? Yeah, and I like, I, I actually like finding characters that I don't think I can relate to at all, because in doing the research and playing the character, the more specific it becomes, the more not only I relate to it, but then I can do something which I think is is kind of thrilling as an actress, which is I can make you relate to it. And yeah, and I can take away any kind of stereotype that you might have about somebody or any kind of labeling. Because we, we all want to be able to say, that's not me. And 
you know, she's the bad. Yeah, label it, put it in a box, like that's, but it's great to be able to play something as really truthfully if possible and very specifically so that you do reach people and they realize, oh, fuck, that is me as well, you know? Right, outside and, of the profession, there's something yeah, that, there. That we're all, we're all messed up in our own ways. And you may not be a drug addict, but you might have issues with jealousy that you don't want, or whatever that you don't want to feel, or, you know, but the point is that we're all sort of messed up. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go about choosing your characters? I, uh, I read in preparation for this, I read that um, at one point in your life you were attracted to characters who smoke. Yeah, because I love to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so oftentimes I would read a screenplay and if the character smoked immediately it was very well written. <laughs> And then I went from that to maybe the character should smoke. <laughs> and, um, Nicotine would make this character feel yeah. a lot. Yeah, I don't smoke in between roles. And then I got to a place where I really quit and I'm not smoking. And that's it. Over Dawn, and I get off at Abigail's party, and she smokes throughout. So you can imagine my secret delight. <laughs> but um, yeah, and it's tricky because I really have given it up, and we haven't been really smoking in rehearsal. Uh, and I'm going to try and, you know, for her it's a lot of show, you know, because she's, she's, you know, she really wants to be very sort of seductive and try and get everybody to uh, loosen up, let's say. So uh, for her, smoking is a big deal, so a lot of it is affect. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if I can get away without inhaling, although if, if I can get away with it, it means if I psychologically can get away with it, because I think I'm going to want as soon as I have it. Want it, but well, Bill Clinton got away with it, so you should be able to do it. <laughs> 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 I'll stick to the questions, no more jokes, I promise. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> I heard that you also um, have um, written diaries in the voices of some of your characters. Is that indeed true? Yeah, when I was younger, I would do that a lot because it would help me get inside the head of the character and um, just create memories for the character and a day in the life kinds of things. And sometimes it would relate to scenes in the actual film, sometimes it would have nothing to do with anything. It would just make me feel that I really understood her as a person and was her, you know, because I could create things. And then I flashed on something in the scene, it was a memory that I created for her specifically. So yeah, I, I don't do that so much anymore. But um, yeah, I used to do that when I was younger, it really helped me a lot. What I've always found interesting about um, what, you, what you do for a living is that you have to immerse yourself in these people and then at some point you have to walk away. Um, sometimes it's after the director yells cut, and sometimes it's after the film is wrapped. But how do you go about walking away, especially when you immerse yourself in these characters so deeply and these characters are often so intense? How then do you, you know, go out for a cup of coffee after the play? Right. Someone who's been, you know, you know gang raped or addicted Whee! to drugs or something um, like that. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you how many men I've run into on the street who have said to me, like, hey, we work together. And I kind of don't recognize them. I'm like, yeah. And I was, yeah. That's not seeing you in last exit. <laughs> um, but the thing is, you when you're playing something like even now doing this play, I always think of it, and it's funny that I'm actually sick as I'm saying this, but I, I always feel like when you act, you get a little bit. It, the character kind of invades you like a virus, really? and it stays with you basically until the movie's over, and then about two weeks later, you come back to yourself. But even now, like my, I'm saying things that I would not normally say, I'm behaving slightly in ways that I'm not, and now I'm old enough that I, although still an ingenue, <laughs> <laughs> I'm old right. enough that I recognize, like, okay, this, this quality that I'm having, or these feelings I'm having are Beverly, which is my character in Abigail's party. These are not really, this isn't really me, this is part of, the way I'm getting into this role, and you know, of course, you know, the way my um, my speech patterns will change, and um, my vocabulary will change, and things like that as well. So.
So you just, it just kind of takes you over, and even though you're not even intentionally, it's not as though I'm method, I don't have people call me by my character name, mm -hmm. you know, I can look at people in the eye, and I'm like, I'm sad, it's just amazing. But, um, you know, I don't take myself all that seriously or anything like that, I really don't. I work really hard, and I love it, and I do whatever I can to be honest and true to that character and communicate that as purely as I am able. See, that's interesting, because someone would assume that you were the type who, you know, would <clears throat> sort of morph into that person and say, just call me by Beverly, I go by Beverly now, or, or some such. You know, I, I find that such a bore. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like whatever an actor sort of needs to do for their work, I respect and I'm all for it and everything else, but when you work with people without a sense of humor, it's really tedious. <laughs> <laughs> Care to mention any names? Yes. I can. I'd love to. <laughs> Come on, we like names here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you've appeared in, I, I can't even count how many films at least. I have no idea. 40? I don't know. <laughs> If somebody asked me that today, I was like, I just don't know. Like, you know, when you're young, you count. You lose, yeah, at what point do you lose I think track? You, can't, you stop counting um, when you keep getting work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're not worried that that's the last job you'll ever get, you know, mm -hmm. then you kind of stop counting. So did you lose track in about, you know, the late 80s? Yeah, probably. Probably so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fast times are rich on high. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any idea that it would become such a launching pad for so many different careers? I mean, Nicolas Cage, Forrest Whitaker, Sean Penn, your career? Yeah, no, we didn't know. We just thought we were making some, like, kind of good kids movie, you know, like good teenage movie. We, we all really liked it, but we had no idea if anyone else would like it. And, um, but it's become such a classic. Yeah, it's like the it's really sweet. Teen sex it's really comedy. nice. And you know, Phoebe's and I have made like best friends, and we met on that, of course. And, and, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, we just had no idea. We all got really lucky, and Amy Heckerling just did an amazing job directing the movie. She really did, and casting it, obviously. So what were the days like on that set? Um. They were, you know, they were fun. I mean, it was it, it was a fun shoot. Our director was really young, groovy mm -hmm. chick. She got married and divorced and remarried like in the space of eight weeks or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. Vivi and I just became very, very good friends, and everyone sort of was who they were, sort of, and it was. It's hard to explain. It was just fun, but again, like nothing was taken too seriously. Although we were all serious about the work we were doing, but we really had no idea that we were making something that would be remembered or would be really popular. Have you watched it recently at all, or no. any occasion to see it? I haven't actually. I saw there was like a retrospective in LA during when anniversary party came out, and I came in just at the tail end, like the scene between me and Phoebe in the bathroom, and it was really because it's so similar to the scene that I have with Phoebe and Amherst referring. <laughs> so, I mean, it just sort of showed me that Amy really cast it well because it, our relationship is is very much that, you know. It's not that I'm like, that these characters were created and we fit into them. It's almost as though they create the characters based on our relationship. Yeah. And so, it seems as though from then on your career sort of took off. Did it just did it surprise you that things would move so quickly? I mean, there was a period where it's really last day to Brooklyn and Miami Blues that changed my life. It changed your life. Yeah, because they both came out around the same time and um, they were very very different characters, and I just suddenly got a lot of attention, and suddenly I was being offered things, and um, you know. There was all this press, and it, and you were in your mid twenties at that time. Oh, mid I would have been twenty six. Twenty six. Yeah. So, last exit to Brooklyn comes out, and then well, let me back. Oh, I was like, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, what attracted you to last exit to Brooklyn? I mean, it, it's well, it's a huge fan of the novel. I mean, you know, 
Hubert Selby just alone, I mean, all of his work is so brilliant. I'd actually seen him read it at the Whiskey, I mean, at the Roxy on Sunset, like, that like? years before. Oh, it was beautiful. I mean, he's such a, he was such a beautiful man, you know. Um, and the character of Charles Law is a fantastically written character. And, you know, it's a great, powerful, powerful piece, so I really desperately want to be involved in it. I wasn't originally cast in the role. Oh, really? No. How did you go about I, um, it then? I, we have it also. Oh, uh, yeah. We need to interrupt. But go ahead. We, um, can we get last step to book one, please? Go ahead, why? We were just all, uh, like, lots of people put on tape, and he didn't audition anybody, per se. We just had dialogue. We just chatted. And, um, and then Patricia Arquette got the part, and then she became pregnant. She couldn't do it. And so, I stepped right in. So then they cast me. And how was that, tra -la -la? I mean, It was great. A... I love playing tra -la -la. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really did. I really did. Watching it is very painful, but playing it was fantastic. It really was. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's just always a different experience for me to watch. I, I yeah, it's such a different thing, you know, because um, for her, yeah. even the gang rape is about getting her ego back. It's about, you know, she used to be the queen of this neighborhood. And she's lost for that because she's sort of been opened up, you know, in terms of her vulnerability. And she can't bear it. And so she wants to get that feeling back of an in kind of invulnerability. And so she's doing it to protect herself in a way. We can see that how damaging it is, how horrible it is. When I saw the movie, it made me sick. But when I acted in it and when we were shooting it, I was having a great time. <laughs> Everyone was like, are you okay? Are you okay? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's intense. Uh, do we have, do we have that? Okay. Uh, right, huh? Yeah, you bet your sweet ass I look sharp. I got me an officer in Manhattan. Rush. 
And I came up with an idea of a movie and I called her and I said, listen, I have this idea and I'd love you to write it. Tell me what you think. Because I always felt a little nervous, like, you know, because I value her opinion so, so very much. And she said, I like it. I think it's good. And, um, and so, yeah, so she wrote it. And we didn't change that comma. How long did it take her to write it? It probably took, um, I know my mother does a tremendous amount of research. I mean, the whole reason I do research is because I grew up like watching a woman who, you know, she has one character that's a plumber. She'll interview like five plumbers and spend a day with them and go to their, it's like mom, but I have three lines, you know. But <laughs> she, that's what she'll do. So her right. house is like plastered with all the research and the photographs. So that's where I um, got all of this from. Um, so she probably spent three months doing research. And then she writes very quickly. And then she probably wrote it in a month, and then it took us about two years to raise the money. Yeah. And you, you step back behind the camera again for anniversary party. Correct. Can we play a clip from the anniversary party? And then I'll, I'll ask you the question after. Do we have that? Okay, sorry. I love that. <laughs> and um, I was telling you back, back backstage or in the green room that I've had the pleasure of meeting Alan Cummings on a few occasions. Um, you all know Alan Cummings, obviously, okay. And um, he's quite the character. You met him on Cabaret. Yeah, right? we did Cabaret together. It's coming. Just coming. Yeah. No, Sorry. Like, no, because he like the so pink kids. Like, Okay. No, um, he has a perfume now. I know, um, called Coming. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's going to have like a whole, and I'm not making this up just to get a laugh, but he's going to have like a body line like coming on in your body, coming in the shower. <laughs> coming in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> he's great. <laughs> no, he really is. He's so. Like working together, it was crazy because we, we only just met on Cabaret, but we had obviously a great time working together. And then we'd come to LA, stay at the house, and um, I just, uh, we just really got on like a brother and sister. I mean, we really got very, very close very quickly, and we just thought, why not write and direct something that we could put our friends in and make a movie we would want to go see? And um, But take me back to the day when you decided, or do you remember when you? you both decided that this was something that you were going to actually do. Yeah, we, was, uh, we were in uh, the living room in L.A., and I had just done a dogma film in Africa called The King is Alive, and I was telling Alan how effortless it was to shoot and how much fun it was and how cheaply you can make a movie because it's all digital. You know, Now it's all old hat, but at the time it was kind of a new thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then we just started talking about, you know, the shitty scripts that were out there and this and that and the other. And we thought, why don't we just, it's a very sort of juicy girl, kind of, you know, and what's his name? Moment. <laughs> and um, Mickey Rooney, I remembered. Um, so we just thought, you know, why don't we just make a movie that we want to go see. And we tried to figure out what that would be. And we very much wanted to play a couple, and the whole idea of it being an anniversary party in which the marriage dissolves and it gets destroyed. One of the reasons that I love the film is because we've all been to those soirees when things just go nuts, and all of a sudden you're sitting there like, what just happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you she, really like Abigail's party. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait, actually. <laughs> But um, how did you go about, you know, writing this? Did you draw upon real life experiences? We, did you all sit together and brainstorm? How did you? Decide? No. First of all, we just figured out exactly who we wanted in it of our friends, mm -hmm. and then we wrote. We thought what would be fun for them to play. We knew their cadence. We knew their gait. We knew, you know, so much about them. So it was really fun to write for them. And um, we, Alan and I, would improvise all the scenes, and then. You know, we would keep honing it down, honing it down until we had like a complete outline, the whole thing verbally. And then we pitched it a bunch of times and then we got you know, our deal, luckily, amazingly. And then we wrote it very, very quickly. Um, was the process smoother than you had hoped or it was, not as It was ridiculously smooth. Really? I mean, I've just never experienced anything coming together that quickly, that effortlessly. Um, where and, and the whole 
shoot was so much fun. It was like having all your best friends over for 19 days. We only shot it 19 days. I was going to say, you shot it in a matter of weeks. Yeah, we had John Bailey shoot it. It was a brilliant DP. And Carol Littleton edited it. We just had all these amazing people involved. And all our friends showed up. And it's one thing to like call your friends and say, hey, we're writing this movie. We're writing a part for you. And everyone goes, yeah, great. But then when you say, we actually got the money and we're starting in a month, you know, then people are kind of like, oh, you <laughs> still less excited, but um, then yeah, then I, but everybody everybody showed up and showed up. Yeah, everybody. And the thing is that we um, at first we thought we would write a script that it would be mostly improvised, but then we really liked what we wrote, so then we didn't we got very like possessive over script. We didn't want anyone to improvise anything, except for the. There's a part in the movie where toasts are given, anniversary toasts, and we, except for Gwyneth's toast, because it's a plot point with the ecstasy, we had all the actors, we just sat with them and talked to them about what we needed from them, and then, but they wrote their own toast so that we could actually be surprised in the moment and have that experience. Now, I would imagine stepping behind the camera for you would be both terrifying and invigorating. Am I right in that? It was really, it was, uh, you know, before we began, or, I don't know, it was so exciting. It was not terrifying it because I think we were so well surrounded with so, so many great people. And Alan and I are both really um, organized and on top of it and prepared. You know, we both worked really, really hard. Um, and so we were really ready. I mean, we finished many days early. And we also had the greatest cast. I mean, you're in good company. You know. <laughs> so it was very doable. And it just felt great, and also if, as an actress, you know, directing myself. I mean, it, uh, it was very easy because I kind of knew what the director wanted, <laughs> 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 and I didn't have to kind of intuit anything. Right. And um, it was very freeing, and also. <laughs> You never had that experience that you have a lot as an actress when you walk on a set and you look around and you say, this is not at all what I had imagined. Because when you direct something, it's exactly, you know, as you imagined it, so. Is it something that you look forward to doing again? Yeah, I would love to do it. Do you have anything in mind? Um, not quite at this moment. <laughs> now, for you, this was sort of acting is in, in your DNA. Your mother was a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. was a screenwriter. Your, your father was, you know, like Moreau, a famous, famous actor. Did you really have a choice about pursuing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my parents would have supported me in whatever I wanted to do. I mean, my mom didn't, you know, it wasn't that she, I don't think she loved the idea of me being an actor necessarily. Did she try to discourage you at all? Only when I was a kid, because I really, you know, wanted to act from, you know, when I was really little, because I loved doing it, and I just felt more comfortable when I was acting. Really? Um, do you re remember when you sort of fell in love, when you were bitten by the bug? Um, it just came out of Playhouse, you know? I mean, like, Playhouse, and like, well, let's put on a show, and I was always, like, very bossy, and, you know? <laughs> getting my friends together and creating plays and all that. So I just, because other than that, when I wasn't doing that, I was very shy. But when I was doing that, I could become very kind of like bossy and, and I felt very um, strong. Mm -hmm. So I always loved it because I felt very alive when I would act and very freed up. Um, but my mom really didn't want me to act as a kid professionally because she, what were her reservations? Reservations were that it kind of ruined the childhood that if you are, if you do have talent, it can be destroyed as a kid with a bad director because they can start you can get bad habits so easily. So kids are so instinctual, you can mm -hmm. just sort of let them be. So she thought if I was really serious about this, that I should just sort of enjoy it. And you know, I could go. I would. I went to like Station Manor, which is this acting camp. They made a movie about it a couple years ago. Um, but. Um, but not to really do it seriously. But as soon as I turned, even before I turned, when I was 17, I got an agent. 
And you dropped out of high school to pursue acting, correct? Yeah, I got a job. You got a job. I was very bored at high school. Like, <laughs> the last year of high school, I was basically, you know, just going to Westwood and going to see movies. I wasn't sure. Um, so then I got a part in this B horror film that shot in Florida, and I just left. It was six weeks before graduation, and I just left. And I always promised my mother I would take the GED and get the diploma. <laughs> I think you've done well for yourself. <laughs> so, um, what do you think when you see you? You those lines were obviously very interesting. Some of those that, things that were. That, yeah, I had that scene. I actually yeah. was in. Um, I mean, it was such a fun thing to write. But um, I was, you know, taking a yoga class in LA a couple months ago, and a girl came up to me afterwards, and we're all kind of look horrible and sweaty. And it's like I know it's probably not the best time, but. I'm doing your scene in that first part of my acting class. <laughs> she said, it's really hard, but it thrilled me. I know, you know, the idea that I wrote something the kids are doing in acting class was kind of a great, I mean, it's great. I love that. What advice did you give her? I didn't give her any. Different way. In what way? 
it's scary and it's sadness and, and it's relatability. So they're no longer like this monster like outside. Like you really, you can relate to them. And that's, that's what makes it powerful. Now we can shift gears. I, we don't have a clip of this, but I want to talk to you about playing Dorothy Parker. So I mean, she's obviously such an icon. Yeah. Was there any fear stepping in? Yeah, there? that was terrifying. Really? Yeah. Talk, well, first of all, about like, that. you know, I just done the shortcuts with Bob Altman, mm -hmm. and I was playing a phone sex operator. And uh, <laughs> how did you research for that role? <laughs> oh, that was fun. I went to all these different phone sex places, and um, really, <laughs> yeah, like one was a factory. I mean, really as big as this room with cubicles and every single person taking a call, like doing calls all day long. Wow. Another place was more intimate, it was a woman's house. And then there was like the heavy metal guy who had broken his leg, who would do it from his apartment in the valley <laughs> with a falsetto voice. You know, <laughs> it's not what you think. And you know, the girl's house I went to was having a dinner party while she was doing it. It's like, you know, I went through all the records, there were a lot of names I recognized, and there's nothing is... <laughs> Did you warn them? <laughs> you guys, I gotta tell you. <laughs> it's not, um, you know, there's no, uh, they don't care about you. <laughs> they really hate to don't. break it to you, but they don't care about and you. And they make fun of you. I mean, it's just, they, like, the people are just, you know, while they're doing the thing on the phone, like, Everything I do in that movie, I aside from diapering the baby, which was my invention, but everything else I witnessed, you know, really? people, magazines, like, uh, uh, having oh, it's yeah. just, I'm not, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not, I mean, I, a guy doing it, you know, a heavy metal guy, you know, with a big picture of Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman on his door, like full-size posters, jerking off these guys on the phone, and he's doing it well. <laughs> but, uh, now, how did you get into that? Did you ever It's ask? good money. Really? Yeah, it's very good money. Did you ever work the phone a bit? No, that was crossing the line. <laughs> 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 you know, you, you make your own boundaries. For me, that was going too far, but I listened in a lot. And, um, sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't want to make a phone call myself. <laughs> I totally understand. But the weird thing about Dorothy Parker was, Parker was at that rap party for Shortcuts, Bob said, Jennifer, I want you to meet somebody. And he brought me over to Alan Rudolph and he said, Alan, this is your Dorothy Parker. And Alan was like, oh, really nice to meet you. And uh, that's a lot of pressure. I was like too. stunned right? because I don't even know how he could see Dorothy Parker and what I did in Shortcuts. Did he explain it to you? <laughs> no. Really? <laughs> Now, Bob doesn't really explain things. You know, he's very mischievous, but he knows. He's like, you know, he's obviously been a huge influence on my career. And um, I'm ever, forever grateful to Bob for, for seeing, you know, that in me. And yeah, and I was terrified because she is an icon and everyone has a very clear perception of her. And I had to kind of break through that and just find my way. And, you know, again, tons of research. I found all these recordings of her, and she, you know, I felt like recordings of her just being, excuse me, being interviewed, and um, then there are the records of her doing her poetry and her short stories, and those were really helpful, and there's a bunch of books written about her, and of course, all of her own writing. So, um, you received awards for that performance and a yeah. Golden Globe nomination, but there were some people who, you know, weren't too fond of the accent that you chose yeah. to use. Yeah, some people really hated what I did, you know, which is fair, but from my point of view, if you are playing a real person and her voice is available to you, right. and you have a facility for that, to not do it seems disrespectful. And so I did it. And I, you know, it never bothered me that people hated that, people had a problem with that, that's fine, but it, it's exactly how it <coughs> Sounded. Um, so I, I, I feel kind of proud about it, but I know it is something that really drove people nuts. Some people nuts. <laughs>